Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters weekly update week 62 and it's been another very dramatic week in markets with a lot of volatility in energy markets in particular and I'm afraid the return of Covid but before we get into it Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Keith, what do we have this week? Thank you, Richard. Okay, a lot of news. First of all, the war in Ukraine continues to cause disruptions in lots of unexpected areas. So Ukraine has halted production of two factories that produce half the world's supply of neon, which is used in semiconductor manufacture. So that will have knock-on effects. Well, frankly, the knock-on effects are just very difficult to predict. Expect disruption. And now China has moved to stimulate the economy. It's taken measures to boost the economy in the first quarter and introduce policies that are favorable to the market. And the Chinese stock market took that well. And as we go through this, you'll see that Chinese industrial activity and economic activity has actually been better than expected. The Fed and the Bank of England both raised rates. So the Fed raised by 0.25% to a range of between 0.25 and 0.5% for the federal funds rate. The Bank of England raised by 0.25% to 0.75%. And 0.75% was the Bank of England base rate pre-COVID. So it is normalized to pre-COVID levels. I should also say that the Federal Reserve warned that it would do quantitative tightening. And finally, I'm afraid COVID is making an unwelcome return around the world, but particularly in Asia, and Shenzhen has locked down. So supply chain difficulties are not going to improve. So going through some economic data, and there was quite a lot. So if you're interested in all the data, please pause and have a look. We are going to concentrate on the US where we had some preliminary numbers for March, and they're surprisingly good. So for example, the US Michigan survey of consumer sentiment, it only dipped slightly from 62.8 in February to 59.7 in March. So the war in Ukraine has not had an enormous effect. And I'll also highlight inflation expectations dipped in March, but were still ahead of expectations. Now, continue in the US, the business condition survey in March took a dip and missed expectations. But again, given all the disruption, the huge spikes in energy prices, I don't think that's that bad. Now, if we go to Europe, on the other hand, so the expectations for the economic sentiment index for March were 15 which would be well down on February's 48.6, it came in at minus 38.7. So economic sentiment in Europe has taken an absolutely enormous hit, and we will show you the chart in a minute. And that, frankly, is rather what I was expecting to see in the US. So what we're seeing is resilience so far in the US and an enormous hit to sentiment in Europe. Now in China, we had numbers for Feb January and February in one go. 
I don't quite understand that. I think that must be disruption around Chinese New Year. And they were all good. So consensus expectations for industrial production were 3.8% year on year, came in at seven and a half. Retail sales expected at three and a half percent year on year, came in at 6.7. So China's proving resilient. I, I think we need to view the Chinese figures with a large grain of salt, Keith, because they are renowned for not necessarily being entirely factually accurate with their figures. And they do look remarkably remarkable, don't they? Um, yeah. 7.5, 7.5, 6.7, 6.7, and a massive increase in Chinese retail sales when they've got COVID problems, lockdowns, and a big problem with their um, property market. So, Very um, good point. Richard Charts. So the economic update charts. So the Fed dot plot implies the Fed funds rate will approach 2% by the end of 22 and increase um, by another 0.75% in uh, 2023 to a peak. But we all know the Fed dot plot historically has been a um, poor predict, uh, predictor of future interest rates. And I suspect that this one will be the same. Yeah, I don't think there's a cat in hell's chance they'll get to 2.75% in 2023. But part of the way they work is to, um, is to talk the markets, mm -hmm. isn't it? And by talking, you never know really whether they actually expect something to happen or whether they're just saying they expect it to happen, they're fully expecting something different mm -hmm. to happen because they play this game of bluff and double bluff. Yeah. So here we are, the massive increase in interest rates that we've just experienced in context. I actually think the fact they're raising interest rates at all could be actually a big policy, policy mistake. There's so much inflation, as long as wages remain below inflation, and they are now, then that is deflationary, and that is taking demand out of the economy. And the fact they're now talking about raising rates quite quickly, I think you're just going to kill the economy. We shall see, but I, I agree with you, Keith, and the oil price is clearly major tightening, as we discussed last week. So Chinese stocks have an epic bounce on stim Chinese stimulants. Yeah, I mean, the stock market reacts the same way around the world. If a government announces stimulus, it's beneficial for the market. Yeah, but I also say, Richard, I think they were oversold. You know, I think markets are so, so thin these days, you get exaggerated mm. volatility. So this, uh, this chart shows the euro area Bloomberg consensus GDP forecast, which appears to follow reasonably closely the economic expectations measure. And we've seen economic expectations plunge in the last couple of weeks. And that suggests that the GDP growth is going to stall and possibly, probably depending, turn negative, i.e. a recessionary environment. Yes. So that is my expectation, as we discussed last week. Yeah, and it's my expectation as well. I think it's very difficult to see how it can be avoided, given the huge hit to energy prices that has occurred, plus the fact there's a war very close to Germany. Yeah. Chinese loan growth is on a consistent downward path, really, with a bit of an exception in 2016. Uh, suggesting that the Chinese economy is going to continue to slow. And China industrial production, well, well, personally, I don't believe these numbers, so I don't think there's much point in commenting on them. Uh, likewise, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, well, the thing is, Richard, this is within the government's remit, fixed asset investment. So yes. if they have decided that the economy is slowing too much and they're just going to throw money at the problem, this is what you'd see. Mm. It is, isn't it? But it's just this, you know, the, none, in, none in January, or whatever, you know, with what the statistical reason for that is. So let's wait and see what happens. But I think the Chinese economy is struggling. And, I agree. Um, UK GDP growth year on year. So the numbers that came out recently are actually relatively good. Um, as I always say, this really depends on whether the inflation number is accurate. Mm. If the inflation number is out by a couple of percentage, then real GDP is significant, 
significantly affected. But on the face of it, this looks reasonably positive for the UK. As does the UK unemployment rate, which is still moving down. Uh, and the UK claimant count is falling, which is what you'd expect if the unemployment rate is dropping. The Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. So I wasn't particularly surprised that Ukraine hasn't particularly affected the US um, sentiment. And I think that this is 5,000 miles away from the US. They're used to being sort of militarily engaged halfway around the world. Mm. And um, I think far more likely it's going to be the impacts, the second order effects of increases in food and oil and energy prices generally. And the Philadelphia Manufacturing Index is very positive. And US housing starts following this upward trend. Now, I find this mystifying, actually. We'll, we'll go through this in some detail a bit later because mortgage rates are rising. Therefore, housing affordability must be coming down. So how come housing starts are so strong? That doesn't well, look okay. sustainable to me. Uh, Philadelphia Business Conditions Survey showing business conditions relatively um, benign. The initial jobless claims have pretty much stabilized at around about this 200,000 level. And continuing jobless claims, probably I think stabilizing now. And as we've discussed, the EU economic sentiment indicator is very, very poor. It's almost down to the COVID level. Yeah. And EU inflation is only going to continue this really unpleasant upward trend. Core inflation looking very low. I mean, I know they measure it quite carefully, but it's not really a reflection of what's actually happening to people, what, what, what they're experiencing in the economy. Yeah, and it just seems to lag also the uh, main inflation index. As inflation broadens, it's going to spread into the core items. I think the core inflation figure, if you look at that, you just think this is a, this is a number that doesn't have any credibility mm. in terms of what people are experiencing. And while we're on inflation, let's move on to Inflation Watch. And so we had EU numbers for February, 5.9%, core 2.7%. And the other news, obviously, was interest rates. So UK has raised their rate to 0.75%, and the US has started its tightening cycle. The EU remains at zero. Okay, so while we're on inflation, warnings about how energy price inflation is going to massively affect UK households. Goldman Sachs is estimating the majority of households will see their energy bills exceed £3,000 from October. Remember, that there's a second round of energy price rises in October. And Aurora Energy Research, a consultancy, are saying that the increase in bills in the year 22-23 will be equivalent to adding 6p to the basic rate of income tax. So that is going to be a big hit to consumers' budgets. And this is what they were forecasting there could be a further 80% rise in energy bills later in the year. And I just don't think the economy can survive that without having a recession. And when we're talking about the knock-on effects of these rises in energy prices, you know, they're very unpredictable. So a cyanide maker, and cyanide is used a lot in the gold mining industry is uh, closed down in uh, this in the Czech Republic. It produces 15% of Europe's cyanide. 
and cyanide prices have risen by 25 to 30 percent but the prices of its inputs natural gas ammonia caustic soda have risen by 270 percent essentially putting it out of business and then wheat continues to rise it's had a bit of a pullback this week but it's still very high now, on the uh, on the subject of wheat i was reading an article yesterday um, about what is likely to happen to the Ukrainian harvest. And basically, um, clearly there's a question mark over the effect of the war on it. And is planting happening? And will they be able to harvest it? And if they can harvest it, will they be able to transport it? This article said that uh, um, the reporter had observed that the Russians had destroyed 12 combine harvesters. Mm. And clearly that's anecdotal, but it's very difficult to see that Ukrainian grain production will not be really significantly affected by what's going on. Absolutely. Food prices grind relentlessly higher. And fertilizer companies, so fertilizer stocks have actually outperformed energy stocks over the course of the last two years. And if we look at the prices of fertilizer, they've gone absolutely parabolic this week. So this is Brazilian potash, this is US ammonia, and this is Egyptian urea. It's not coming oh. down. No, one of the problems is that farmers won't actually be able to afford to buy it. So even if the grain prices reflect uh, the increase in fertilizer costs, then the, um, they won't be able to use it for this harvest. So it'll, it'll affect bad effect this year's harvest you're right richard there's a cash flow issue isn't there there is they've already yeah. see they've received the money for last year's crop they need to invest in fertilizer for this year's crop and the prices have gone up they won't be able to afford it and this is u.s inflation and the components and you'll see it's not just energy so energy is green but the majority is just widening inflation Inflation measures, it, you're getting inflation from all components. Inflation is broadening. So this is German inflation, and it is truly frightening. So the dark blue line is Eurozone CPI. The lighter blue line is German CPI. And frankly, this uh, chart rather reiterates Richard's scepticism about all headline inflation numbers, because then when we look at PPI, the dark black line, that is at over 25%. Wholesale prices are at 20, what, 7%? Import prices, 16%. Those eventually, PPI will start feeding into CPI, you would expect. Inflation seems to have only one way to go. Yeah. And looking at that, uh, looking at the, the blue lines, Keith, of, of um, um, CPI versus PPI, it looks as if when you get a peak of, of um, PPI, CPI lags it, but also is around about one third of that peak. Mm. So given where we are now, you'd expect German uh, or Eurozone CPI to hit probably 10% in the next couple of months. Now, Oliver Blanchard, who is the former chief economist of the IMF, is saying the Fed is so far behind the curve that it will need to raise rates sharply to bring inflation under control. He's saying the last time there was anywhere near this gap between core inflation and real interest rates was back in the mid 70s. And so the, he's saying the Fed is going to have to play catch up, raise interest rates quickly, and that's going to have quite a bad effect on the economy, I would say, amidst rising energy prices. As we have discussed before, inflation is deflationary as long as wages fail to keep up with inflation. So you see here the pink line is producer price inflation inverted and advanced by 18 months. And the dark blue line 
is the ISM manufacturing index. So essentially what this chart is saying is that 18 months after a spike in inflation, you get a turn down in manufacturing. So that's saying actually the expansion will may continue for a bit. So the recession could be a while off, but expect a recession. Okay, new section, invasion watch. Inflation watch, invasion watch. So, well, Ukraine is definitely winning the Twitter war, but Russia is actually making slow progress. So expect this war to just grind on. Frankly, I don't expect Russia to come to the table with serious proposals until it doesn't feel it can win. Richard, your okay. thoughts? Yeah, so I think that, um, I think Russia is suffering unprecedented damage to its, um, it's to, to its military, to, to its um, artillery, transport, tanks, and even to its helicopter fleet, possibly not so much to its aircraft. And I don't think it actually can sustain this rate of attrition for very much longer. Uh, there's also a question mark about how many cruise missiles they have in store, or perhaps they can start carpet bombing rather than using cruise missiles. But I think the key here is that can they maintain this rate of attrition? And I may have got this wrong, but I think they have put around about something like 60% of their military capacity into Ukraine. And they can't put 100% into it, clearly, because uh, it, it needs, you need to withdraw for um, recommissioning, servicing and so forth units. Uh, and also they need to maintain security on their other borders. They can't be manufacturing equipment to replace their losses, uh, partly because they can't import some of the key components and they won't have the electronics or all of the kit that they need now. So I, I think the rate of attrition that they're experiencing is unsustainable. They either have to withdraw or they have to be creating so much damage to civilian property cities that Ukraine gives up. I don't think China is going to do anything other than verbally support Russia. Mm. And I think that their best interest currently lies in not doing so for a number of reasons, one of which is that Europe is a huge market for China. China has significant economic problems with its own. It simply can't afford to be put on the sanction list and denied access to the European market because that would crucify its economy. Um, so I think that Putin has backed himself into a corner and built a um, and created a, a calamity for Russia. The, what, how does it end? I, I don't know how it ends. I, I, you know, what does Putin do to get out of the, this mess of his own creation? I don't know. I don't know what it is. Well, I agree with you that I don't know how he gets out of this, and, but I think this grinds on. And on the, the um, point about um, inflicting massive collateral damage in an attempt to uh, reduce Ukrainian morale, frankly, that just never works. The Germans tried it in the Blitz in Britain, and actually it hardened civilian attitudes to the war. The British tried it in Dresden and Hamburg, and it didn't work. It actually, when you look back, it was a waste of good men's lives on our side, and it did not uh, bring the end of the war any closer. So I don't think that that strategy, which they will almost certainly try, will be effective. So I don't think that they can um, quell the, the civilian population either that way or militarily, because they are, you know, they're basically fighting a guerrilla war, and if they surround a city, even the Ukrainian army surrounds, you know, or, or, um, interdicts the surrounders and just continues to cause this massive damage on their equipment, which simply is not suited to be on the receiving end of the, the advanced weaponry that Ukraine is deploying. And they don't have enough infantry. I mean, I guess the solution, I'm not a military strategist, but I guess the solution would be to have um, 
a uh, much larger infantry protecting the yes. mechanized army, but they don't have that and it doesn't have any morale. So I think that if Russia stays there, they, then their military power is slowly ablated to nothing. Well, let's see how they get on as we cover this week on week. But on your previous point, Richard, there is a lot of stuff on Twitter. And we've talked previously about how I don't think the uh, Russians can hold cities. And there's a short video, which we're not going to play, but I took a still from that video. And that shows a Ukrainian inside an urban environment, we don't know where, holding the most enormous sniper's rifle, which is automatic and it's one of these. It shoots 0.57 cartridges, which are enormous. They can penetrate that's, armored vehicles. And that's, that's inches, isn't it? So it's, yeah. it's like a 15 millimeter, probably something like a 15 millimeter round. Yeah. And you can't spot him. They, you know, there's no way you can work out where that fire is coming from. You know, so the moment you get into urban environments, you're being sniped at from loads of hidden locations. And the more you degrade the city, the more of these little cubby holes and um, hidden locations you create. So in conclusion, I just think he's going to find this going very tough and he doesn't have enough men, as you say, to hold the cities. Yeah. Okay, moving on to other topics. Well, the energy return on investment. Now, we have previously talked about the green transition and how actually majority of the world's energy system is still fossil fuels. Well, one thing we haven't talked about is that renewable energy is just vastly less efficient in terms of the energy return on investment than our fossil fuels. So if you think about energy, any energy system, initially you have to put in energy to the project. So if you think about a coal mine, you actually have to big, um, dig a huge pit and then build all this equipment the lifts, et cetera, et cetera, the conveyor belts. So initially you have a net energy loss in investment in your energy system. It then over its lifetime produces a lot of energy, although there is ongoing energy needs and get digging your coal out. And then finally, there's uh, some small decommissioning energy losses. If you think about a coal mine, you have to re-landscape, et cetera. So you can look at the energy return on investment is how much energy you got out divided by how much energy you put in. And this is the energy return on investment for different systems. Now, the winner by a huge margin is nuclear. So the energy return on investment of a generation four nuclear reactor is about 750. So for each unit of energy you put into it, you get 750 units out, which is fantastic. Generation three, about 75, still great. Hydro, really good. Coal, 30. Combined cycle gas, 28, great, but you know, digging those gas wells, putting in all the pipes, etc. Uh, that's quite energy intensive. Contra concentrated solar power is pretty good. Wind is pretty good. Solar photovoltaic is really quite poor. And you then have to add battery systems, etc. They get very poor indeed. You're getting barely any more energy out than you are putting in. Now also think about the investment return being linked to the energy return. What 
as an investor, what return are you going to get by investing in either an energy uh, nuclear project, solar project, gas project, wind project? Essentially, investing in renewables is probably not going to be terribly lucrative compared to investing in either hydrocarbons or nuclear if nuclear could get its act together. One of the reasons for that is the material intensity of solar vo photovoltaic. See, it contains a lot of cement, steel, and actually rare metals. And as a result of all that, countries which have a high proportion of wind and solar in their energy mix also have higher electricity prices. In conclusion, the energy return on investment of renewables is much lower than fossil fuels and nuclear, and therefore is likely to have lower investment returns, but also to what extent has the very high growth in renewables over the last decade been facilitated by very low energy costs. And now that energy costs are rising, the costs of concrete, for example, which is uses vast quantities of natural gas, et cetera, all those costs are rising as well. Therefore, the costs of renewables will also be rising. Something to be aware of. So we're gonna have a look at credit spreads now. So this is a graph of uh, three month LIBOR versus the overnight interest swap rate. And the overnight interest swap rate is the central bank in rate of interest, overnight rate, and three month LIBOR is the three month lending rate between banks. And if you get a, an increase in the spread, it means banks don't like to lend to each other and therefore they want more return in interest than they will get from the overnight deposit with the, with the central bank. So it's a sign of stress in the banking system when that spread increases. And at the moment, there is little sign of stress in the banking system according to this measure. So um, this is the US high yield bond ETF, which is um, basically invests in junk bonds. And um, clearly businesses that have to borrow at high interest rates, i.e. have to issue junk bonds, are the most susceptible to economic damage and downturn, the weakest uh, businesses. And the interest rate on those bonds has gone up dramatically in the last uh, three to four months, um, and by around about 11% looking at it by eye. And that is a reflection of a decline in confidence in the ability of these businesses to survive. And that suggests that the high yield credit investors consider that the US is heading towards recession. So this is the price of the high yield ETF and it suggests the price of the high yield ETF is suggesting that the US may be moving towards a recession. And as junk bond yields rising, it suggests to everybody that the economy is moving towards a slowdown, if not a recession. And so equity markets tend to struggle for the same reason. And that's what we're seeing here. And junk bonds are very volatile and they can fall a long way very quickly. And what this chart suggests is that junk bonds may have quite a long way further to go, like another 10 to 15 percent decline, for example, down to the COVID era level of 85 or so. Uh, and that would be a dramatic shift in confidence in the US economy. And the Goldman Sachs Financial Credit Index is, has shot up parabolically over the last few weeks, suggesting that. Um, well, one, it's tighter than its long run average of 100, but also suggesting that financial conditions are changing very quickly. Mm. Yes. Rapid changes in the financial market are never good news. So default swaps, credit default swaps 
are nervous and the price of credit swap, default swaps yeah, for US banks are also increasing, increased by 40, 50, 60% over the last uh, couple of months. And that suggests that there is concern over the stability of these large US banks and their exposure probably to Russia, to Europe, uh, and to the, one suspects, the commodity market. Mm. Well, there are a lot, a lot of losses around where nobody knows where they end up. And yeah. they almost certainly go through the banking system. So, so uh, this is a graph showing the spread between, well, difference rather, between the interest rate that investors are asking for corporate bonds in the US versus in Europe. And clearly, they're looking for around about a 10% margin, a 10% additional margin over US for European lending, which suggests that they see Europe as being a greater risk than the US. So, Keith, what is this chart telling us? Okay, so what this chart shows is the, the dark blue line is the balance between upwards and downwards earnings forecast revisions. And you'll see that in recent months, there's been a big drop in the balance, which is now about 50%. So analysts are no longer upgrading their US corporate earnings forecasts. And so what happened during COVID was a lot of companies took on extra debt and now their earnings aren't improving anymore. So are credit markets becoming concerned about the debt sustainability of the lower credit risk companies, i.e. junk bonds. And that's what we're seeing, I believe. Yeah. The Chinese high yield bonds are continuing to sell off deals passing 25%. Oh, this graph really does look um, of great concern. It must be causing the Chinese government and central bank a lot of concern. Well, these are, dips. these are well beyond default levels. And Evergrande, Bonds are now yielding more than 100%. So as long as they don't go bust in the next 12 months, you can make a profit simply by buying and holding for 12 months. And then they can go bust, assuming they, they actually pay. Yes, <laughs> that, can... that's quite a big assumption, Richard. <laughs> yeah. So our advice, not that we give advice, is don't buy Evergrande bonds. Hmm. And the Chinese property crash is continuing in the background. Um, so this is the this is the background to um, the increase in Chinese GDP that we saw at the start of mm. the, our talk, and uh, explains why I simply don't believe it. Yeah. So these are the bond bond prices of uh, Chinese property developments. And Chinese real estate bonds are continuing to sell off, as we rather saw in the last chart, but they've dropped from four hundred to one hundred and fifty, which is like. 70% decline. Yeah. That is a painful drop. Yeah. And China new home prices are falling. Um, and um, it isn't surprising. Uh, it's an indication of the economic problems that they have in their property market, which, as a reminder, is around about 30% of their GDP. Yeah. And which everyone has been forecasting would collapse for the last 20 years. So maybe that time has arrived. Yeah. And the bonds on a slightly different subject, not China, but um, commodity trading houses. So commodity trading houses have been very exposed to the, the very volatile um, commodities market. They hedge, uh, they both hedge commodities, but they also speculate themselves in commodity prices. And um, Trafigura, I think, was involved in the nickel LME, nickel debacle, which is still ongoing. And basically, they have had these massive uh, margin calls coming in recently, but they don't have the funds to pay. Investors have dumped their bonds because they see them as now being very high risk. Uh, and also, the commodity trading houses are desperate for funds, and they are scrabbling around trying to find people. And there's an article in today's FT on this subject trying to find financial institutions who will fund them. And there's a question as to whether 
this is a systemic problem. Mm. So the um, the financial conditions in index Goldman Sachs uh, in orange is dropping rapidly. The ISM manufacturing index is starting to fall away. There is a, a visual correlation between the two, and the question is: uh, Is the um, ISM going to drop below 50? Um, and looking at this chart, it's quite likely that it does, which is contraction and uh, economic slowdown. US mortgage rates are rising fast. And the interesting thing about this is they are only at the rate they were at three years ago. So there has been, you could interpret this as saying, well, there's been a period of ultra low interest rates to which the property market has responded as it has, but it's now reverting to a more normal level of interest rates. The question is what's going to happen to people who um, are looking to buy, but prices have gone up and have to finance at a higher interest rate. Well, generally, US mortgages are fixed rates, so people who already have mortgages will be fine. They just won't remortgage. But house builders, as we've seen previously, are building loads of new homes, but house prices have gone up by 20% this year. And now, in the last few months, we've seen a massive increase in mortgage rates. So I seriously question whether many of those new homes will find buyers, because at the current prices, they just won't be affordable, given the yeah. rise in mortgage rates. Yeah. And then that puts stress on the uh, builders, the house builders. Yep. So our conclusion here is that uh, credit conditions are tightening and that the financial fallout from the Russian invasion of Ukraine is both difficult to predict and ongoing. There are a lot of insurance losses that we know are going to be incurred in Ukraine, but not just in Ukraine, elsewhere. And for example, I think Russia is considering confiscating a large fleet of airplanes that have been financed. I don't know who stands at those costs. The fallout is going to be significant. It's probably only just started. Markets are concerned. Uh, they're concerned about corporate profitability. A lot of companies who trade with Russia will have to take a hit on that. And China may be headed for a full-blown credit crisis, in which case that's going to reverberate around the world. Yeah. So the bottom line is, it looks like in addition to a spike in energy prices, the world is also facing a credit crunch. So in terms of a private investor, what is their strategy? the environment of a credit crunch? Good question, Richard. Bad for equities, bad for bonds, bad for pretty much everything, frankly, in the short term. So the message is be very, very careful. Yeah, de-risk and wait for the credit cycle to turn. Okay, so the Russian invasion yeah. of Ukraine has exposed the EU's heavy dependence on Russian energy imports. Now, what is its plan to reduce that dependence and gain energy independence? Well, it is to continue the switch to renewables, energy inefficiency to cut its energy imports, but mainly LNG imports. So it's building some new LNG import terminals and the backup plan is switching to coal. You'll notice how when it comes to keeping the lights on, you'll burn anything. So frankly, ESG led switch to renewables with insufficient planning has actually had the perverse effect of causing Germany, for example, to burn more brown coal, particularly now they've closed six nuclear power stations, which, as we saw earlier, are actually the most energy efficient form of power. I think, um, I can't think, Keith, we need to draw a veil over Germany's energy policy. It has been, frankly, insane for many years. Yes. So anyway, details are here if you want to pause and have a read. 
But in summary, these plans are not a quick fix. And the main element is going to be importing LNG. Now, there's no mention in any of these plans about increasing European domestic fossil fuel production. It's about importing foreign LNG. Now, that market is already tight. And so you're going to have to outbid other customers for LNG supplies, which means European gas prices are likely to stay very elevated. And doubling down on renewables, that is not a quick fix. That will only have a marginal impact. And the fundamental problem with in renewables is the intermittency problem, and you need a whole backup energy system, which is going to be LNG, essentially. And there's no mention of nuclear either. So expect European energy prices to remain high, bottom line. So here's a little presentation on diesel fuel, named after the inventor of the diesel combustion engine, Mr. Diesel. And um, diesel is in short supply. So diesel is a, is a heavier oil than um, petrol. And there, there, there is virtually no difference between the heating oil that you use if you have a, an oil-fired boiler and the diesel fuel that you put into your car. In the UK, the only difference is the colour, or used to be the colour, in that um, heating oil is taxed differently to motor, motor diesel. So but what this graph is showing is that US diesel heating oil inventories, as I said, basically one and the same thing, have fallen to multi-year lows. And okay, so they, they do hit that point reasonably regularly, but if they continue to fall any further, they will be at um, a historic low. And US average retail diesel price has surged, actually, in the last uh, year, probably, it has doubled. And um, it's now above the 2008 peak. And it's heading upwards in almost a direct straight line. And then this, this graph is bizarre. EU wholesale price has gone nuts. I mean, the spot premium has gone from virtually nothing uh, to 450. And the wholesale European price has gone from, uh, let's say, 200. Uh, that must have been around the time of COVID to 1800 now. But even if you take a sort of rough eye, eye average over the last five years, it's at least tripled. European wholesale prices at least tripled. And if you want to pay spot, you've got to pay that enormous premium. So where does diesel come from? Well, Russia exports a lot of it. And uh, Ukraine produces a lot of vegetable oils that are converted into biodiesel. China is acting to safeguard its own interests, its own supplies, understandably so. And global diesel demand is continuing to hit highs. So, We've got big disruptions in, in the market. This is already short of supply. With the UK government warning that diesel prices could reach three pounds a litre, which I'm thinking is roughly double what it was at Christmas, and that rationing may, may become necessary. So, and in the West, we don't crack enough diesel. I mean, I have to say, I have mixed views about this because um, when Gordon Brown first introduced uh, the idea that diesel was better fuel than petrol, he, did, he ignored the fact that my, microparticular carbon particles are carcinogenic. Mm. And uh, since then, diesel engines have always emitted carcinogenic microparticulate carbon. I've never had a diesel engine vehicle. I don't have one now. And I think it's a good thing if we reduce our use of diesel. I respect that a lot of people will suffer if diesel fuels double again from here. So the final line, as we've been saying all through, the war in Ukraine is having a lot of unexpected consequences and will continue to do so. Well, the other thing I'd add, Richard, is the world runs on diesel. You know, all the farm machinery, all the transport, you know, diesel spikes, doubles, which they're forecasting, and there are shortages and talk about rationing in the UK, then that's going to have absolutely enormous knock-on effects for the supply chain. And, you know, uh, this... And, uh, and war prices... And prices in the supply yeah. chain, if you're quite right. Absolutely. Okay, other charts. So, 
Bloomberg are forecasting that the recent spike in energy prices will mean that energy costs are 13% of GDP in 2022. And the only other times that's happened, there's been an enormous recession. Yeah. Previous oil price spikes have not led to energy being that much percentage of GDP before it killed the world economy. So essentially, this is why I think we're heading for recession. I just don't think the world economy can live with this. I, I completely agree with you, Keith. And um, the other issue, if it was a, if it was a temporary spike and drop back down, but it's it's not going to be that. Yeah, it's going to be a permanent plateau or continue to continue to increase for a while until the slowdown of the world economy addresses the consumption issue. And UK consumers are going to face a an income squeeze as wages do not keep up with inflation. So they're talking, actually, these are big numbers, almost 4% this year. And I think that's probably yeah. low. I think it's a huge problem. I think that the um, we are heading towards stagflation. And if you uh, earn, say, £30,000 a year, and you're suddenly faced, as, as you will be, with um, 8 or possibly 10% inflation on your own basket, then you are suddenly hit with a huge cost. You've got national insurance premiums going up. Um, and if you get a pay rise of three or 4%, as things currently stand, you're doing very well. So there is gonna be a really big problem coming out of this, a really big problem. Now, back to the war in Ukraine, one in seven of the crew on global shipping is either for Russia or Ukraine. And a lot of the Ukrainians want to go home and fight. So expect further supply chain disruption. Actually, it's a genuinely cheery uh, update this week, Richard. And this is the Atlanta Fed's re GDP now uh, forecast for US first quarter GDP. And essentially, it's pretty much at zero. Is the market too optimistic about US GDP. And this is interesting because this is real time data from Germany on energy use. And you'll see it's been dropping. Well, industrial production uses a lot of electricity. And if electricity usage is falling, then presumably, industrial production has also fallen. We just haven't got the figures yet. So this means, Keith, that we're already starting to see the self-correcting cycle of high energy prices causing a reduction in energy demand. Yes. This chart shows how each country in North Africa and the Middle East, how much of its food consumption is imported. So if you look at Libya, Essentially, almost all its food appears to be imported. Egypt, 60%, Lebanon, almost all of it. High food prices, the reduction in Ukrainian and Russian wheat exports are really going to hit these countries. Are we going to see a return of unrest as we did in 2011? So we have brought back COVID as a, we'll all be aware that it's uh, there are a lot of COVID cases around, so we thought we'd do an update on where we are with COVID. So the um, seven-day coronavirus is cases per 100,000 people. Um, we've had a big spike in uh, generally, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, not so much in the Netherlands. The, um, a big spike in the number of cases per 100,000 people. Clearly, you know, there are a couple of, of things feeding into this. One is vaccination rates are high, and uh, when people do get it, they are not particularly ill, which means that the economies don't need to lock down, uh, or the, well, I should say the politicians don't see the need to lock the economies down. And the other feeding into it is that if people aren't so ill, they feel confident to go out, engage, go to large gatherings and so forth, where of course it's even more infectious and more transmissible even. 
And we then finally, we have the uh, delta cron variant of the subvariant of Omicron, which is about 30% more transmissible than Omicron, which if you remember was something like eight times more transmissible than the original um, COVID that we had two years ago. Um, so it rips through populations and there is a question as to whether we have waning, slowly waning natural immunity. I don't know the answer to that question, but I've seen it posed. So Asia reported infections have gone up hugely, very dramatically. We know that uh, Hong Kong has had a problem, but there, Hong Kong had a problem in people not taking up the vaccine. China has a problem, and China, one of China's problems is signing back appears to not work. So there is very little vaccination immunity. Um, and if you catch Omicron, uh, if a population catches Omicron who has not been exposed to COVID before, it makes them very ill and a lot of them end up in hospital. And it sort of takes you back to where you were two years ago. It may not be quite as nasty, but a lot more people catch it and they catch it a lot more quickly. So the problem that China has is that they do not have very much in the way of herd immunity. And without wishing to sound complacent, Europe does have more herd immunity for the current variant. I should also say that I have COVID and I've had it for the last five days and it's rather unpleasant. I'm glad I've had three jabs. Well, I hope you're on the mend, Keith. So do I. So Vietnam, um, huge spike. And um, uh, New Zealand reported infections. I mean, this is a peculiar thing. Of course, New Zealand has suddenly announced it's no longer going to lock down um, and it's opening its borders. Uh, totally coincidentally to the fact that Jacinda Ardern is now behind in the opinion polls. <laughs> That's it, uh, Hong Kong, which is doing a lot of isolation. Um, mainland China. And, um, of course, all of these new lockdowns in Asia will be contributing to supply chain disruption in ways that we are now familiar with. But we don't have the same level of infection as we had two years ago yet. And Hong Kong's death toll has um, risen hugely dramatically. I mean, I think this is the problem that they um, they basically have low herd immunity and Omicron is nasty if you don't have immunity. And uh, all of these other countries, have, most of these other countries anyway, have had good take up of vaccine. Hong Kong's had poor take up of vaccine with a vaccine that doesn't work. I think this is the fact that the Hong Kong Chinese are not taking up the vaccine, I think is a function of the fact they don't trust the government. They live under a communist system. You know, nobody trusts the news. Why should they trust the um, vaccine? Yes, well, that's probably true, Keith. Cases are rising everywhere, it's rising in the, even in the UK, and um, obviously rising um, in Germany significantly, in Italy. Um, as I say, as long as it remains relatively benign, because we are um, re reasonably immune, um, then it won't cause a problem. I do think as an aside, we do have to acknowledge that our health service is coping with this, it is having a, an impact on it. And the constant complaint, complaints that waiting list targets that were set in pre-COVID areas are not being met isn't helpful. But what would be helpful would be a few politicians from both sides to come out and say, what a fantastic job the NHS is doing and how unreasonable it is to expect it to cope with COVID and all of the previous ailments in a man without without issues, and mm. I just think that that would be some leadership from our politicians, which is sadly lacking. Mm. Agreed. So, yeah, you know, this is more of an economic problem than a health problem. Well, it is if we lock down. It isn't if your population is struck down by it and you're dying in mm. um, a relatively high relatively high infection fatality rates. Um, it is a real issue. We are reasonably insulated against this at the moment. If another variant were to come along that was more dangerous, then um, that would be another thing entirely. Shenzhen locking down, Richard. I mean, China, there's going to be loads of supply chain disruption. We're 
could get, I mean, again, this is like inflationary. The supply chain problems we thought were slowly fading away, well, yeah. suddenly they ain't. On the battle of vengeance. So, yeah, return of supply chain disruptions, um, bad for inflation, bad for the world economy. And we seem to have a perfect storm of things. Mm. So moving on to our weekly checklist of equity markets. The, uh, they all had a good week, actually, although they've had a poor year to date. The, um, so the FTSE all shares up three, stocks up 4.7, S&P and NASDAQ up 3.6. So this is really a, um, a bounce after the very gloomy couple of weeks that the markets had post-Ukraine invasion. And the mantra that I keep hearing everywhere that war is good for the stock market, um, which I think is a very strange way of looking at things. Um, and I think that you have to take it into, you also have to take that into consideration with all the other factors. And as we have been discussing over the last hour or so, the uh, other factors are significant and are not conducive I would say, to a rising stock market. So the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio is still very high, uh, only slightly below the dot com and above the 1929 peak. A mean reversion, a reversion rather to five would be very, very painful indeed. Yes, let's hope it's not that bad, but yeah. we expect some reversion to the mean. We do, we do. Uh, Facebook has a lower P ratio than IBM, um, which is interesting. And people are concerned that Facebook is losing its mojo, um, which it may well be. <laughs> I don't really have a, a view. Um, but this is mean reversion in action, you know. Yes, yes it is. And global earnings revisions have now turned negative, actually for the first time in two years, apart from a little blip. Um, but they've been low, very low positive for the last few months. Yeah, and this to me is the first canary in the gold mine. I think it gets much worse from here. Yeah. Okay, on to energy commodities. And it was an incredibly volatile week. And only in the last day have oil prices bounced back. Reminder... Brent hit 130, and then this week it dipped below 100 briefly. And so you've had an enormous correction, actually, in oil markets over the last couple of weeks. My concern for all markets is the lack of liquidity exacerbating volatility. And so particularly when you get crowded trades, everyone piled into oil and gas and bought the futures, and then when it starts to come off, there are speculators, they want to sell. There's a lack of liquidity and it just flies down in the opposite direction. So this week we had net net, oil was down 3%, natural gas was down 12%, coal 11%, uranium 7%. But reminder, over the course of the last two and a half months, they're still up big time. So Turning to the numbers that matter for the oil market, we are still getting drawdowns in US inventories, which fell 6 million. Now, our figures include the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So if you're taking oil out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, it has no effect on these numbers. Um, US crude production continues to stall. It's not growing. The world's swing producer is not increasing. And the Baker Hughes rig count rose by eight. So activity is returning. Okay, now there's been a lot of talk about renewables, which are only around 2% of world energy <coughs> production at the moment. And according to the best forecast, by 2050, it's likely to be only about 10%. So we are still going to be using vast quantities of fossil fuels for a long time yet. This is crude oil price, 
huge drop and then a bit of a bounce back. And this chart shows oil service costs in the blue line. And so oil service companies are now raising their prices and they want their cut of the big surge in energy earnings. These are seaborne shipments of Russian energy. And you we'll see that Reuters are expecting there will have been drops. Now, I have seen various commentary over the last few days saying the drop has been lower than was expected. And previously, analysts were expecting up to a 3 million barrel a day drop in Russian oil exports. But they now expect it to be much lower than that because there's a lot of hidden exports going on. Tankers turning off their transponders and then essentially doing ship to ship transfers in the middle of the sea and quite difficult to trace where the oil ends up. I thought this was a great chart actually, great map showing the origins of Russian oil and gas exports from their fields in Siberia and how it flows through to Russia, Ukraine, and then onto Europe. Pause and take a look. And yes, a good summary of current EU energy policy. We're going to put you out of business, but fill her up. This is the impact on global oil supplies that the OPEC um, monthly report is expecting there will be on oil markets. So they were expecting almost a 3 million drop in Russian oil supplies. The origins of that drop here is almost entirely Russia. So if that's true, oil markets are going to tighten dramatically. This is the crude futures seasonality chart. Generally, crude prices start rising naturally from here over the course of the summer. Lots of oil gets burnt for electricity to drive air conditioning units in Saudi Arabia, believe it or not. Dutch natural gas futures have come down a long way from the spike, but still very elevated compared to historic norms. Ga Russia has increased its gas flows to Europe. That's in the top chart, presumably because it needs the cash, but it has run down its gas in its storage facilities in Europe. That reduces European gas security. There's less gas in storage. You're more dependent on flows. So you can see that as part of a Russian strategy. And this is gas flow since the start of invasion. You see they've picked up coal, still high. Uranium, still high. Richard. Thanks, Keith. So commodities had a fairly calm week, actually, in parts. So aluminium, cobalt, and copper didn't really change terribly much up on the year. Chromium up a chunky 12%, and iron ore down a chunky 7%. Lithium seems to have just steadied a little bit. Um, magnesium falling away. It had a very strong run in late 2021. It's continuing to fall away. Um, neodymium dropping off has had a very good run. Nickel, very hard to know what's going on with nickel because that was a monstrous short squeeze. Mm. I think we know that there's been some dirty work at the crossroads. The NME is owned by China, the very exposed um, uh, participant was a Chinese businessman and um, the LME suspended trading in nickel when it became apparent that the Chinese businessman had lost $8 billion. Um, I suspect what's happened is that the LME has trashed its reputation and that uh, it will never be the same again. 
remains to be seen. Uh, tin down 4% on the week. Ferro-vanadium up, up, up uh, uh, 14% on the week. Mm. And ferro-vanadium had a very powerful year. Commodity stocks haven't really reflected the big rise in commodity prices that we've seen. You know, reversion to the mean, particularly with these large commodity price increases, you would expect commodity stocks to move up, back up to, let's say, 200, which would be probably tripling or so from where we currently are. And so just running through the charts, we have aluminium, cobalt, copper. So this is a chart from last week, which shows copper inventories. And we were then talking about how Goldman Sachs were forecasting that even without any disruption in copper flows from Russia, that copper inventory is going to be very tight for me by the end of the year. But then this week, miraculously, the Chinese appear to have found some copper. You look at stocks at the Shanghai Futures Exchange and China bonded warehouses, suddenly copper's just appeared. How have they done that? From their strategic reserve, presumably. Hum. Chromium. Iron ore. Lithium. Not coming down. No. Magnesium. Neodymium. Coming off a bit. Nickel. Yeah, that's not the real price, is it? I mean, we don't know what the real price is. It's the financial price. Tin and ferro-vanadium. Don't know why it's spiking like this. Yeah, odd. So on precious metals, um, basically not a good week for any of the precious metals, but a reasonably good year to date figure for all of them. So gold, silver, and platinum all down between one and a half and three and four percent. Uh, rhodium unchanged, palladium down. Um, a large 13 percent year to date gold silver um, and platinum up to five or ten percent and then rhodium and palladium up in the mid 30s um, i think gold and silver are, are a um do reflect flight to safety we discovered we discussed a little bit the my views on the gold market last week uh, we won't go to that again but i think that as a long-term trend gold and silver are inevitably going to have higher prices in a year or two years time than they have now. So that's the price of gold, had the spike with the invasion, that spike has been brought back down. And silver, sort of similar, but a short, smaller spike. Platinum, I think is quite, you know, it's quite a lot of platinum use is, is industrial and motor vehicle manufacturing. Motor vehicle manufacturing is also being hit um, and rhodium also, and palladium. Thank you, Richard. Okay, on to rates. Well, the Bank of England and the Fed both raised rates, and there was a rise in rates across the curve in the UK and also in the periphery, although in absolute terms, given that UK CPI is 5.5%, the 30 year yielding 1.8% is not worrisome and real rates remain strongly negative. Now, the US two over tens, which are a forecaster of future recessions, continue to deteriorate, but are not yet forecasting a recession. So, Am I wrong? Is a recession not imminent? And the bonds have performed very badly this year, as we have been discussing and forecasting for a while. This is the 10 UK 10 year, which is at a pretty much a new high as rates rise. This is the US 10 year. And Richard, what have you been up to this week? Thank you, Keith. Well, I'm afraid I've been really boring again this week with no purchases and no sales. Um, 
I did contemplate selling some ferro alloy resources, but I decided not to. I don't know if that's a wise move. Um, so obviously the price of ferro vanadium is going up. Ferro alloy resources are based in Kazakhstan. Um, so I am, I am wondering what to do there. On that note, actually, Richard, ferro alloys is something I haven't sold because I think that it's the share price is entirely dependent on progress on uh, Balasas Kondik, yeah. and that depends on getting the uh, bankable, feasible, bankable feasibility study. And so it's essentially the share price is going to be driven by idiosyncratic risk rather than market risk like mm. economic risk and the economics of the project are just so compelling yeah if they can you know get the feasibility study get funding then i just think it looks fantastic yeah. interesting point keith yeah thanks well i did come across this is an interesting graph showing the strength of um, nato ex military expenditure versus uh, russian and chinese and um what it's basically saying is that the military expenditure of um, NATO far outside out exceeds that of Russia and of China. So the mis one of the mistakes that Putin has made is, is having discounted the NATO's military strength and assumed that Europe would be divided when he invaded Ukraine and wouldn't bring it to bear. And what we've actually seen is NATO united in bringing the massive global military strength to bear on Russia. And one of the things that China will be looking at very carefully is their relative military, military weakness in comparison to NATO. And I'm not really saying anything other than one of the effects of Ukraine is going to be that a lot of countries are going to be reassessing their military, mm -hmm. political, geopolitical options in the light of what we're seeing. And I was also struck by this is that from the um, picture in today's Financial Times, which I think is really shows a lot of pathos. This is a woman shopping in Russia. And, you know, a lot of people, and there's a lot of collateral damage everywhere for what Putin is doing. Mm. And he is not doing his own country any favors at all. And I just think we have to try and remember to bear that in mind when we see all the pictures of. Murder and mayhem in Ukraine. Yeah. Keith, what was your week like? Well, my week ended not too badly. You'll be unsurprised to learn, Richard, that now that my portfolio is essentially 30% cash and 70% oil and gas, that with the oil price coming off, at one stage it weren't looking too good. But Oil prices have snapped back and I closed the week down 0.5% plus 8.4% year to date. So I continue to outperform the all share. Now, regular viewers will know that last week and into this week, I just cut everything. And so this is not an exhaustive list of everything I've sold, but these are the low lights. So I will be doing, when this cycle is over, I will be doing a full portfolio review, looking at what worked, what didn't work. But the preliminary results are very much that my attempts to diversify away from oil and gas have been very mixed. And my focus on looking at turnaround situations because they're hopefully highly geared to the upside have been total failures so james fisher and sons has cost me a lot cost me two percent of the portfolio when the shares fell by 56 percent essentially again i overweighted it because um, i thought it was diversifier away from oil and gas well it was a terrible investment saga I mean, I think when you get out, you have to kill all your darlings, sadly. I really like Saga. But 
when uh, UK consumers get their energy bills, then they're just not going to be able to afford to go on holiday, I wouldn't have thought. And, you know, interest rates rising, et cetera, et cetera. Saga is going to be squeezed by rising wages, rising fuel bill, um, get out of cyclicals. And I sold essentially all my um, non-energy commodity stocks because there's a slowdown in the world economy demand for metals will fall so generally i made decent money on those what did i buy well i went back into bp and i bought a bit more harbor energy so i am uh, doubling my uh, on my energy bet but to be clear it is now just a question of timing this trade is coming to an end and it's a question of timing the exit as i expect oil prices to rise over the coming months because we are not yet at the point of demand destruction oil prices need to rise to the point where supply and demand come back in balance right now demand exceeds supply as exhibited by the continual declines in oil inventories around the world Okay, so the one stock I want to talk about is Harbour Energy. This is the share price, which is incredibly indifferent given the rise in the oil price. That's Brent in orange. So Brent shot through the roof, Harbour Energy gone nowhere. And a big explanation for that is their hedging policy, which has been totally inept to my mind so in 2021 they realized losses of 1.52 billion and they have out mark to market losses on their outstanding hedges of 3.5 billion now last year they recorded net profits of 101 million and free cash flow of 678 million so it's essentially all the profits of this company are going to Wall Street. They're going to the people who bought the hedges. So management are running the company for the benefit of Wall Street, not for the benefit of shareholders. Now, in part, they're partially forced into that because they had a lot of debt and they need to hedge to ensure that they have good income to make sure they can pay their debts. But I also think that they just don't understand why people invest in energy companies. You invest in energy companies for the upside. If they've got market losses on outstanding hedges of 3.5 billion, are they actually going to be able to recover those when they when they produce the oil? Is yes. that is that the deal? So effectively, yeah, you have to mark to market the losses, but you know they're actually they're hedging future production, and they don't. We have clarified this with the company. Thank you to Miles Forty Four on our Discord, who wrote to them, they do not have to post margin. So there's no solvency issue here. But, but they're selling their oil at $40 a barrel or whatever, and, yeah. and the, um, the owner of the hedge is selling it at, always at the current oil price. Precisely. You know, they've hedged 63%, by my calculation, about 63% of oil and gas uh, for 2022, and they've hedged at $61. You know, so all the upside, oil's now 100, they're saying it's 61. You know, they just don't understand what an oil company is. Um, now, Rambler had a bit of good news this week. Well, market took it well in that they sold their gold stream or they reorganized the uh, sale of their gold stream. And it would be nice one day for Rambler not to be having to continually raise money, though, to be making yeah. profits from the mine we await that date now gold plat which is my one remaining gold share which i really like had its interim results this morning operating profit up 28 percent revenues year on year up from memory 70 percent profitable attributable to sorry profit attributable to shareholders up a hundred percent Bear in mind, they bought out a chunk of their minority shareholders this year. 
So hence, more of the profit is flowing to shareholders, up 100% shares flat. So I reckon this is on a P ratio of three. You know, I think it's amazing. And now that they're concentrating on the gold recovery, yeah, I think that at some stage, when they have stopped investing in the business, they'll be throwing off a lot of cash. And that, some of that cash should come to shareholders, surely, he says. Okay. Thank you all for watching through to the end. There is sadly an enormous amount happening in the world economy this at the moment. And when things calm down, we will calm down. But currently we're having, uh, these are quite long updates. So thank you for sticking through to the end. Please can you press like and subscribe to the channel and it is goodbye from Richard Wheater. And it's goodbye from Keith Shaw. Goodbye. goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.